On the 18th of June, 2023, a submarine named Titan that was run by Open Gate Expeditions went missing in international waters on its way to explore the Titanic wreckage. As of this filming, there is hope that the tourists that are on that submarine will be found. Now, I started this video with the intention to talk about the overlap between artificial intelligence and intelligence submarines, ways that they can be used for rescue missions, things like that. But once I realized how insanely deep 13,000 feet underwater is, where the Titanic lays right now. I realized that every one of these like, you know, interesting, cool, like rescue robots, they would all get crushed like tin cans. In fact, if Titan is sitting at the seafloor right now, there is more than a car's worth of weight on every square inch of that vessel. But actually what turned out to be really interesting and informative to me was the way that the rescue mission is being conducted. So the airplanes, the sonar buoys, the deep sea cable ships, and the insane DARPA Sea Hunter. But it was just insane scripting today, so just forgive it if it's not as complete as usual and we're gonna try to get the editing done in a really timely fashion, so. Here goes. So this is what the Titan submersible looks like that might have five people stuck in it right now. So I'd love to tell you about the technology on this submersible, but there's really not that much. And look, I hate to judge a book by its cover, but this was the earlier version of the Titan, not the one that they're in right now. This is the one that they're in right now, and it doesn't seem as polished. Now, I really don't care about what the outside looks, but if you notice the cables and things like that seem more concealed and safer in this. Like some kind of piece of metal or something on the Titanic, like that could probably catch one of these cables. I mean, there's something just about the way the cables are hanging out that just seems unsafe to me. I don't know, and like these thrusters, there's only two to go up and down. There's only two to go back and forth. So if one of them gets clogged or goes out and you turn on that motor and one doesn't work, it's just gonna spin you in a circle. like. Maybe a, a backup set would be a good idea. Now, to be fair, the website says there are seven emergency backups, which does seem like a lot of redundancy to their credit. Meaning if something like that does happen, you can drop the lead pipes off it to make it lighter so it floats back up. There's a balloon that inflates to help it go faster or if the lead pipes don't work. So there's sandbags that are actually just meant to dissolve no matter what anybody does. That ship should be just coming up and rising at some point. Which is interesting to me because it does feel like if you're in an airplane searching the surrounding area that seeing them pop up to the surface might be very likely. Now, as of filming, they're completely lost now. We don't know where they are. So if it doesn't surface, is it caught on something or did it actually implode? So it was built to go 13,000 feet underwater. That Titanic is actually at 12,500. So there is a little bit of leeway room there, but maybe a little bit more would be nice. But it's more than that because here's where things really get dicey. There's no onboard navigation system. The support ship that should be right above them sends them messages through text message. And I'm just gonna assume that text messages work well in water or whatever kind of system they have on the boat above them. But there's definitely questions in my mind about like, are you sure it can go that many feet straight down into water? And it's through those messages from the ship above that they're actually giving the directions. Like the ship there knows where the Titanic is and it should know where the sub is. But if it loses contact, they're not gonna get the directions they need. And so once they lost communication, it, it seems reasonable to me that they, you know, you just get confused, like which way is north? Like, how would you know under there? Another frustrating thing, this acoustic device is called the Pinger. It's an underwater beacon that pretty much all submarines have. And guess what? The Titan might have one. They're not sure. So the CEO is actually in the ship right now. Is he the only person that knows if it's on there? Well, that would help because that gives a specific signal that can be triangulated from the ocean. Well, that beacon could be a godsend for them because that can be triangulated in a search and rescue mission. I mean, at least zip tie it to the cables. If they're caught on something, if they're passed out, you could at least locate the ship. So you probably heard about this part. The controls are actually a Logitech $30 controller. Not kidding. This is the Logitech GF710 controller and it's hooked up to the four propellers. Now, I'm actually gonna defend this move a little bit because one nice thing about having a mass produced product is that it's actually fairly reliable. You know, because if you actually build your own controller, there's a lot more things that can go wrong and there's only one person who built it that knows how it works. At least the Logitech F710 has been given to thousands of people and perfected by a big company. So that's probably not so bad. There is no USB cable that you could even plug in. I can't believe they're only using a wireless controller. I mean, don't you think just like, I don't know. Like, don't you just think like have a controller that's powered by the main battery as a backup? I mean, I guess a cable could get like tripped up on someone's foot or something, I don't know, but I just have to wonder. Now that's the breakdown of the Titan submersible. And if you're not impressed by that, you'll be impressed with how much money it costs to take a ticket on this ride. So when you pay OceanGate $250,000 to go visit the Titanic in this Titan submersible, you get to be one of three guests going along on this ride along with the pilot and a guide. Okay, so the trip is eight days total. It takes at least two days to get 
to the Titanic, two days to go back, and then the days that you're right above it, you can go up and down multiple times. So as they take it off the big boat, they drop it into the water and it starts to submerge. You're supposed to get a message and give a message every 15 minutes, so there's always a little like update. So another thing I wanna mention is the waiver. So CBS actually did a piece on this in 2022, and he mentioned on the waiver, it mentions death three times on the front page, and that you sign a waiver knowing that it's an experimental vessel. The waiver said it has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body. You know, I mean, the CEO of the company is down there right now, so obviously that would give me some confidence, and this has happened. This is the not the first time it's been to the Titanic. Now, once the big vessel gets right above the Titanic, you get into the submarine, which is still on the deck, and they bolt you in. It is completely airtight, obviously, and then they drop you into the water. There's no hatch that you can pull from the inside, which we're going to talk about later in case they come to the surface. That's still a scary situation. And of course, the ship is giving you the directions, letting you know how far off course you need to go, I guess which direction to go, things like that. Now, this exact submarine has visited the Titanic safely before and come back to the surface. However, it hasn't been without some negative and scary history. In 2018, the Marine Technology Society wrote a letter to the CEO saying this could be very dangerous. And in in response, he argued that industry standards are slowing down innovation. Now that same year, Oceangate actually sued one of the pilots who was piloting one of these submarines. And his countersuit back to Oceangate said that he was fired unlawfully because he had security and safety concerns. You know, I don't know if he was fired unlawfully or not. I just. This is just more red flags to me. Now, we don't know a lot about some of the other dives that have come successfully, but we know about the 2022 one because the CBS reporter was on it and he's been talking about this. And on that trip, the Titan did lose communication for a little while with the main ship also. Hope that's not the same problem this time. On another occasion, the Titan's thruster was installed upside down and it was backwards, which caused the submersible to spin in circles when they tried to go forward. Also, just for the record, I'm getting a lot of this stuff from Wikipedia. It's been being updated a lot today. So I looked and clicked through to the sources so there's some there, but obviously it's it's probably not the most credible thing ever. So just take this with a grain of salt. But I've seen these stories repeated enough now that there was some concerns. Like I would not have gotten in this thing. And I think, I hope they all come back very safe and I hope everybody lives long, happy lives. But I do think that if they do get found that that CEO should definitely be going to court and should be held liable for something or at least tried for something. And of course, that's just my opinion. I'd let the court of law do its thing, but I just, there's enough here that someone should be talking about something. Oh, and I forgot that in 2022, there was also a battery issue on another dive that's well documented, which it said led to some external damage when it was being lifted out of the water too. So hopefully that's all fixed. That's done, that's done, I gotta move on. Let's talk about the timeline of events. So walking through what happens, it was about two hours after it started its dive that they lost contact. They still felt like everything was gonna be fine, so they didn't contact the Coast Guard until it actually didn't surface at an expected time, which was called later in the day. I don't know what time that was supposed to be. But when it didn't surface at that time, that's when the distress signal was called out, and there's a few possible things that might have happened. So let's walk through them. So one is the communication gear just stopped working, but they were completely safe and still in control of the vessel. In that case, they couldn't talk to the crew, but they could move around and maybe they just moved incorrectly very far away from the expected place and they're on their way to the surface. So hopefully an airplane finds them on the surface, gets down there, unbolts it before they run out of oxygen, even if they're sitting on the top of the water. Now, another issue could be that it's stuck and it's still floating somewhere in between the seafloor and the surface. Now also, maybe some of the mechanisms that make it float just didn't work, but they're still okay, they're alive, they have oxygen, but they're stuck on the seafloor, which is, which is very scary because that's 13,000 feet deep and that's crushing pressure and you've got a hook to it, pull it up with like an anchor or something, just seems really hard to me. Now people were talking about getting stuck on something, which I think the only thing you could get like stuck on would have to be at the ground level also. So I'll assume those are kind of the same. And the other thing is it could just be an implosion, just a true collapse. Like the glass broke, the, the metal couldn't hold it anymore. And it just wasn't able to stay together. Now we'll start talking about the rescue mission. I'll just go from top to bottom. We'll start with the airplanes. Now this is international waters, but luckily multiple countries quickly volunteered airplanes. They fly very fast, so they were able to look on the surface of the ocean in lots of different places very quickly, and they're still doing that to this moment. Also, losing control in any way, even if they're unconscious, but having the boat float to the top would be the best outcome, I think, and hopefully a plane spots them, they get a boat to it, they unbolt it. So there's more planes than this, but the ones I could verify as of right now is a Lockheed CP-140 Aurora aircraft. There's at least three different C-130 Hercules aircrafts in the search. And a P-8 Poseidon aircraft, and this one's probably the most interesting because it has 
has the sonic buoys on it. All right, now this sonic buoy thing is really interesting, and this is why if you ever get in a submarine, just check for that pinging mechanism. So here's what the sonic buoys look like, and this plane, which I think is the P8 in this situation, not totally sure about that, but it's the one that's been modified to hold the buoys and can drop them as it flies over. So it can fly in a grid shape, dropping these like on the corners of a grid. If you imagine grid paper, you could drop these on like each of the corners. Start right above the Titanic, you move out in all directions. So there's other types of noises this could pick up. They could knock on the hole, or maybe there's some kind of other sound that this craft can emit. But these sonic buoys are listening for anything that's not natural organic sound. And when it pings off one, there will be a slight delay on the ping off the other two around it. And from there, you can triangulate where it is. So they're ejected from this aircraft canister, and then they deploy on the water impact. So an inflatable on the buoy floats so that the radio transmitter can always be above water. And then there's some stabilizing equipment. There's some pings that it does to the other buoy so it figures out how far away it is from all of those. It sends a bunch of information to the aircraft so it can figure out where all the buoys are and make sure they're all talking to each other correctly. Okay, and then the buoy is gonna relay the acoustic information through something called a hydrophone, which communicates just through classic UHF, VHF radio signals between the airplane and the buoys. Although I found one website that said if this was a military use case, there'd actually be some secret encryption stuff, but they're not using it, but I don't know about that. It wouldn't matter for the search. Now the US is sending a submarine rescue vessel, which would be the perfect thing for this kind of problem except it really doesn't work at the depth of 13,000 feet. So in the case that it makes better time than expected, and maybe if this submarine is pinged and located, actually kind of stuck in the middle somewhere, this, this could be the saving grace, but it seems kind of low likelihood to me. Now, another really fascinating piece of military equipment that would be helpful now if it could be there in time, but it can't, is called the Sea Hunter. And this is a completely autonomous boat. It was created from a partnership between DARPA and the Navy, and it does something really unique. So basically there were these big nuclear submarines, but then all of a sudden diesel submarines showed up and they run much quieter, so they're much harder to detect. And in response, that's where this project came out of. In 2010, DARPA and the Navy started building it and it now exists and it's actually in use. The Sea Hunter is interesting because it can go 90 days on its own autonomously. So you can have a lot of these things floating in all sorts of places all over the world. And it works in conjunction with airplanes, specifically the P-8 Poseidon we talked about, which is there right now. A few other aircrafts in the Sono buoy network that we talked about for isolating pings. And what it does is once it can locate one of these very quiet submarines using some probably artificial intelligent algorithm they're actually top secret, but whatever its magic sauce is for knowing what the very quiet diesel submarines are, once it locates it, it's actually faster and can maneuver better than the submarines, so it sits directly on top of it. It doesn't care about the depth, but it cares about being exactly above it once it finds it. And by the way, it's not armed. It doesn't have weapons on it. They call it a shadow vessel because it just sits above and basically is like this thing, like, hey, right below me is an enemy. And the talons are a parasailing sensor. So it can just launch a paras, like, you know, a parasailer? Like it can launch a parasailing, but it's not a person. It's a bunch of sensors that also can help it track down submarines. So back to the real ships that are there right now looking for these people in the submarine. There is a lot of them actually. So it took a little while for a lot of the ships to catch up to them, but actually the first one of real significance that was there was a cable laying ship. So these pipe laying ships are also out of control. They have these amazing, amazingly thick wires because they're dropping in a cable, usually for internet to actually talk from like Europe to America, it has to go underneath the entire ocean. That's the kind of ship this is. And it happened to be in the area and those ships do have to deal with the super depths, including 13,000 feet, not a problem for their kind of machinery. And that ship was also connected to some ROV, some remote operated vehicles, which can also withstand those pressures. So they can basically lay cable. They can send their own little submarines down to look for it and see how the cable's being laid. And from what I understand, I didn't get to see what those ROVs look like, but they might even have grabbers and stuff to move the cable around, which could be really helpful. Maybe they could grab onto this ship and like lift it up or at least attach it anchor to it or something they could pull it up on. But unfortunately, even though more ships now have shown up like that to help out if we can find it, they don't know where it is. It isn't found yet. The US Navy announced that they're sending experts ahead of time and then to catch up to them is something called a flyaway deep ocean salvage system. And that is a ship lifting system. That is the kind of ship that can handle a ton more weight than its actually own weight. And it can grab onto all four corners of something, lift it up, scoot out of the way, bring it up to the surface. So it's really impressive. And that could be very helpful if they can find this thing. So I am keeping my fingers crossed that this all turns out well. I hope everybody makes it home safe. Um, by the time I get this video actually edited and uploaded, you might know the answer. There still could be some time, but we're probably coming to about less than 24 hours of oxygen at the time of filming. So we'll see what happens.